Yeah, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is David Headley. Uh, I'm an engineer with Eurotech and uh, yeah, hopefully after the end of my presentation you'll know about everything we, we do and um, you'll sort of come to think of us on future problems that you may have and uh, think of you know, yeah. solutions that we could sort of hopefully provide for you. So in terms of what we'll go through today, a um, bit of history about the company, how it started out. Uh, we'll talk about some of the innovation, safety and program benefits of the uh, solutions that we provide. I'll then talk about the actual solutions and the services that we offer um, and then talk about some previous projects we've completed and then summarise and take questions at the end. Um, but feel free to jump in with any questions you've got as we go through. Um, so Eurotech, who are we and what do we do? Well, we're a contractor that specialises in the use of expanding geopolymer resins as a method of non-disruptive ground, uh, ground stabilisation. Um, and it's kind of an alternative to the more traditional, perhaps more intrusive methods such as piling traditional amber pinning. Um, so what we do is we inject uh, expansive geopolymer resins into the soil to stabilise soils and to increase bearing capacity of soils. But we can actually use the, the high expansive force of our materials to actually attempt to re-level structures where they've suffered from settlement. So, you know, uh, raising and re-leveling of ground bearing floor slabs and we do actually have the ability sometimes to uh, actually attempt to lift up foundations where they've suffered from subsidence. Uh, in the UK we've been operating for about 30 years, uh, the company actually originated about 35 years ago in Finland and that's where Eurotech Worldwide are based and they basically set up a, uh, a licensing business so they sell Eurotech licenses and someone in whatever country they're based in can buy a Eurotech license and operate as a Eurotech contract contractor within that country. So we've actually got a presence in about 50 countries throughout the world. Um, but in the UK, yeah, oper operating for about 30 years and we've completed many thousands of projects. So this slide here, we're going to talk about innovation. So here we're going to actually talk about the materials. Um, so this is a sample of it basically. Now as I'm talking about it, I'll just pass it around. So the first thing to mention um, is that these materials cure very, very quickly. Basically, what the material is, is there's two components, there's two liquids, and when the two liquids meet, there's a chemical reaction between the two liquids, which basically causes the expansion of the liquid into basically this material here. Now, once it's injected, it cures in about 30 to 40 seconds, so it's very, very quick. And what that means is that if we're stabilising a concrete slab on a motorway, once we've cleared site, it can be trafficked immediately. There's no sort of hanging around, waiting around for cure times. The same thing is if we're um, stabilising soil underneath uh, property foundations, you know, the material cures in about 30 to 40 seconds. And once we've cleared site, you can do permanent repairs to cracks, put in heli bars, that kind of thing. You don't need to wait. Um, so very quick cure time. Another thing to mention, it's a very lightweight material as well. And you'll get an idea as you fill the sample. So it's very lightweight. The typical sort of installed densities you're going to get range from about 150 to 300 kilos per cubic metre. So it is a very, very lightweight material, you know, especially if you sort of compare it to concrete, for example. And the benefit of that is, is that we're not actually in, when we're injecting it into soil, we're not actually inducing that much additional weight onto already sort of problem soil. So there is a benefit there. Um, we actually have 27 different resins. They all have slightly different attributes in terms of strength. Uh, how far they can permeate into the soil and that kind of thing. But what that means is that we can look at a vast array of different types of projects and hopefully we've got a resin that's most suited to actually undertake the work. Um, now, the very important thing to mention is that the material is not affected by temperature in any way whatsoever. So what that means is we can work all year round, winter, summer, really makes no difference. Temperature will not affect the material at all. So that's certainly something, something to, uh, to bear in mind. Um, it says there the, the, the uh, material has an uh, expansive force of 10,000 kilopascals, so it's a very, very high expansive force, but what that means is that we can basically use it to uh, re-level re -level structures and slabs where they've suffered from settlement. Um, and um, all of our works come with a 10-year uh, guarantee on design, workmanship and material, um, and this material itself has actually got a design life in excess of 100 years. Um, so I've just sort of talked some about sort of the key, key facts there about the material. Um, just talk about safety now. Um, so this sort of slide just sort of highlights that we are a professional company with all the necessary accreditation and certainly to get on all sites within the UK. All of our, um, our operatives are directly employed, you know, we don't employ agency staff to undertake our work for us. Um, all of our operatives carry CSCS cards, uh, PTS to work trackside and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of product safety, once the, product, once the material is actually installed and uh, is cured, it's a totally inert material. Um, it's not going to contaminate soil, it's not going to contaminate groundwater or anything like that. Um, and also it's non-flammable as well. So just a few key points there. 
And then program. I've already mentioned that these materials cure within about 30 to 40 seconds, but because it's such a non, you know, the way we install the material, because it's so non-intrusive, you know, when we're dealing with, you know, residential projects, for example, it's usually sort of one to two days on site. Um, so if you compare that to like piling or traditional underpinning, there's a real program benefit there of using the Eurotech system. So I've just sort of gone over quite quickly there some of those um, things about the material and sort of safety and program and hopefully you'll understand what that all means now when I talk about what, what we do and how we install it. So basically these are the four areas that we work in. Uh, we've got slab stabilisation and re-levelling. We've then got ground improvement, so that's basically where we're in, injecting into the soil at depth to improve the soil. Uh, we then got uh, ground, improvement with, ground improvement with what we call structural support. Um, and then we've got uh, void filling and water sealing. So I'll just talk about each of these now in a bit more detail. Uh, so stabilisation and re-levelling of uh, sunken slabs. So this applies to any kind of concrete slab, basically. Uh, a ground-bearing floor slab in a property, uh, a concrete slab on an A-road or a motorway, or a, you know, a ground-bearing concrete slab in, a, in, a, in an industrial setting, you know, in, a, in a warehouse. Um, so the typical sort of works that we get involved with would be ground-bearing floor slabs in properties. Um, I suppose if your slab has sunk in your property, what are the sort of usual solutions that you'd look at doing? Maybe you just do a self-leveling screed over the top of it, just so you haven't got that nasty gap between the slab and the bottom of the skirting board. Um, I suppose the worst case scenario would basically dig out all the slab, put a new one back in, but then you know, it's the time scale of doing that, it's the disruption. Um, and also, if you're just doing a, a screed over the top, you're not actually dealing with the problem of why the slab's gone down in the first place. So this is where you need to think of Eurotech. Um, so what we do is we take the area of the slab that we're going to treat, we come in and we drill 16 mil diameter holes in a grid pattern at 1.5 metre centres across the entire area of the slab. Steel tubes are then inserted through each of those, those holes that we've just drilled, just into the sub-base or the fill or main ground material just beneath the slab. We, we then turn up, uh, we have a 12 tonne lorry, and that's about 8 metres long by about 2.4 metres wide, and that needs to be parked within 100 metres of the site. And there's basically a hose running from the lorry, and we attach that hose via an injection gun to the steel tube and we inject the material through the steel tube. Now before we start injecting any material, we set out laser gauges onto tripods and they're there to monitor for lift and they're accurate to half a millimetre. So we attach the eject injection gun to the steel tube, pull the trigger and then we start injecting the material through the steel tube into the ground underneath the slab. <coughs> what the material will do, will do is it will fill any voids first, it will start filling any voids that are present underneath the slab and then within seconds the liquid material will start expanding into this. And as it does expand, it's going to compact and consolidate the existing sub-base, and there will come a point where all of the voids that are present underneath the slab have been filled, the sub-base has been fully compacted as much as it can be by our material, but because it's still expanding at that point, because it's filled all the voids and it can't compact the sub-base anymore, it's then going to start pushing upwards against the underside of the slab. And as soon as it starts doing that, the laser gauge that we set out to monitor for lift is going to start flickering, showing lift. Now it's accurate to half a mil. So as soon as we get that lift on the underside of the slab, the laser gauge will flick up between 0 and 0.5 mil of lift. Now if we're looking just to stabilise the slab, and what we mean by stabilise is just ensure that the slab is supported by the sub-base underneath, that's the point at which we stop injecting. So when we get that flicker of lift, that's effectively verification that the slab is now supported, and then we just move on to the next injection point and just work in a sequence like that. Now from each injection point, you get a spread of about 1 to 1.5 metres in all directions of our material. And the reason it can't travel any further than that is because of its quick cure time. So effectively, after that 1 to 1.5 metres travel, it's gone off, cured, will not travel any further. So that's why we do an injection point in a grid pattern of 1.5 metre centres. And what that ensures is that you've just got a good, even distribution of our material underneath the slab. Now, so that's stabilising the slab. If we're looking to re-level the slab, once we get that flicker of lift on the laser gauge, we then just continue to inject material, and basically we can recover the settlement and monitor that in basically half mil increments as we attempt to bring the slab back up to its original level. Now, say for example, the, the whole slab has dropped by 100 mil. You're not going to bring up each injection point 100 mil in one go. You might do each point 5 mil and do it in passes. But the reality is, when, until you actually start injecting, you don't know what kind of reaction you're going to get. Um, and that's how it's done, basically. So each of the steel tubes are then taken out of the injection points, all of the holes are made good, um, and then we clear site. Now, in terms of any investigation works, you know, what do we need the client or the customer to provide us before we turn up to site? Not necessarily a great deal of information. Um, certainly if it's just sort of a ground-bearing floor slab in a property, um, it's just a case of us undertaking a site visit, agreeing the scope of work with the client, you know, how much does it need to come up by, and that kind of thing. Um, 
Maybe if we're dealing with a, a large area, mm -hmm. area of slab in a warehouse, for example, uh, it might be a good idea to do a level survey because it's quite a large area and we know the tolerances and how much we need to bring the slab up by. If it's uh, concrete slabs on a road, um, you know, maybe you could do a GPR survey. You know, that might, might identify where there's potential voiding or soft areas of ground that need stabilisation. But the reality is we don't need a lot of investigation works uh, beforehand. It's just a case of us undertaking a, undertaking a site visit, basically. Um, it says there we can complete uh, 600 square metres in a typical day. That's probably utilising three Eurotech teams. Now, one Eurotech team is basically a vehicle and two operatives. So uh, one team could do about 200 square metres in a day. But, you know, for most sort of properties that we're working on, it tends to be sort of one, maybe a two day job, you know, depending on you know, how big the area is. Um, in terms of things that we need to be aware of when we're on site, uh, first thing is probably services. Um, last thing we want to be doing is drilling through the slab and then, um, you know, there's a water pipe or, you know, a gas main underneath the slab. Um, it's more sort of applicable for when we're doing sort of highway projects, um, certainly with services underneath the slab. So what, if we're doing quite a large area of slab stabilisation and re-levelling, uh, we quite often get a, um, a utility mapping company come in, do a GPR survey and just basically identify the services and spray them all up for us. Um, but then um, drains, certainly need to be aware of where all the drains are running because uh, the last thing we want to be doing is injecting our material. <laughs> we're not getting that flicker of lift because all our material is flooding the drain. So, um, so yeah, it's quite a good idea to maybe do a drain survey prior in a residential setting, um, just so we know where all the drains are running and to ensure that they're all in good working order. Um, and if the survey identifies any repairs that are required, you know, the displacement of the joints or you know, cracks in these relining, for example, uh, it's a good idea to have that done prior to any Eurotech works because that's just going to reduce the risk of our material getting into the drainage system. But in any case, when we're injecting near drains, we can provide a separate crew that we call drainage protection. And that's basically just a drain crew and they're equipped with CCTV. So they'll basically be sending a camera into the pipe to actually monitor it when we're injecting near to it. So they can basically see that our material is not getting in. Uh, if our material does get in, they can see it on the CCTV camera. Our operatives then stop injecting immediately. Within about 30 seconds, our material will have cured within the pipe. Um, and then that drain crew is equipped with a jetter to basically jet our material out of the pipe and ensure that we haven't left it blocked, basically. Um, so we can overcome issues with drains and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's basically stabilisation, re-levelling of slabs. <coughs> we then come on to uh, strengthening the ground beneath the foundations, uh, what we call ground improvement. So what we're doing here is we're injecting our material into the soil at depth underneath an existing foundation in order to improve the soil, improve the bearing capacity of the soil to allow the soil to take the load of what is built on top of it. Um, so typical... Um, Scenarios we're doing this on uh, would be subsidence work, basically. Um, or other scenarios may be uh, a refurbishment project. You may have an existing property. You're increasing the loads, the loading on the existing foundations, requiring, requir requiring them to be underpinned or piled. You know, we could improve the soil underneath the foundations to allow that additional load to be taken. Um, so uh, before we turn up to the site to do any, any sort of ground improvement works, yeah, we definitely do need some investigation works done beforehand. Um, basically, we need sort of soil investigation. So first thing we want to see is um, a borehole. Um, so basically, what that's going to tell us is going to tell us what the soil type is, what the soil, the, uh, soil type is. Um, now, in terms of soil types and suitability for the Eurotech system, Eurotech can be used in all ground conditions, all, all, all soil types. Um, some soil types are more suited to Eurotech than others, so um, granular material is ideally suited to Eurotech. So it can really sort of penetrate the sort of voids and micro fissures um, and basically sort of mix with it and do its job. Um, when we're dealing with cohesive soil, um, we like to look at the uh, Atterberg limits and we like to look at particle size distribution. Now, if the plasticity index is sort of 40% or above, um, it, you know, it might alter the guarantee we can give on the project. Um, and basically what we're, what we're saying is that if you've got a subsidence and there's issues with um, you know, high volume change potential with clay, we can't alter that at all, um, you know, if the subsidence has been caused by uh, shrinkage, for example. Um, but basically we need that ball hub to tell us what the soil type is. Um, we're then going to look at um, end values or DCP testing, um, and that's basically going to tell us the existing soil strengths. Um, now basically if we're doing a, uh, you know, stabilising a, a property, suffering from subsidence, we're going to be looking at that investigation work and we're going to be looking for the depth in the soil, which the soil has the ability to take the load, be it one metre beneath the foundations, 
or two metres beneath the foundation, so whatever depth it is. The maximum depth we sort of can treat to is about sort of 15 to 20 metres below ground level. But, you know, it's very rarely that deep, it's probably an average of about two metres. So we're going to be looking for that depth or the firm horizon in which the soil is good enough to take the load. Or, for example, you, uh, the client may tell us uh, the loading is 200 kilonewtons per square metre. We're going to be looking for the depth at which the soil has the ability to take that load. So that's basically going to determine our treatment depth. Um, so in terms of how, about, how we go about installing you know, this particular solution, so for example, we're dealing with a, a strip footing. It's an external wall. It's 10 linear metres in length, and we're going to treat to 2 metres depth beneath the foundation. Uh, basically, again, we just need our vehicle parked within 100 metres of the site. Um, and it's an ex external wall and basically we're going to start off at zero metres along the length of the wall. We're then going to drill right up, against, right up externally against the wall and we're going to drill down to a depth of one metre beneath the foundation. Now hopefully the foundation's got a nice projection, we're actually going to look to drill through the pro projection of the concrete to one metre depth. We're then going to insert a steel tube through that hole that we've just drilled to a depth of one metre. So our vehicle's parked within 100 metres, again there's a hose running from the vehicle, attach it to the injection tube via an injection gun. But before we start injecting, we mount a laser gauge onto the wall, and that's there to monitor for lift. So we pull the trigger, and we start injecting our material at a depth of one metre beneath the foundation. So from that injection point at one metre depth, again, you'll get that spread of about 1 to 1.5 metres in all directions of our material. And basically what we're kind of creating is a, a 1 to 1.5 metre diameter pressure bulb, basically, of resin soil. So as we're injecting our material, it's going to fill any voids that are present with the soil, and then within seconds our material will start to expand. And as it does so, it's going to compact and consolidate the soil to increase its bearing capacity. Now there'll come a point where any voids that are present have been filled, the soil has been fully compacted as much as it can be by our material, but because our material at that point is then still expanding, at that point it's going to start pushing upwards against the underside of the footing. And at that point the laser gauge will flick up between 0 and 0.5 mil of lift. As soon as we get that flicker of lift, we stop injecting because that is basically verification that the foundation is now supported by the material that we've just injected and we've improved the soil as much as we can do. So we've stopped injecting, we then remove that one metre steel tube that we've just put in, but because we go into a depth of two metres beneath the foundation, we're now going to drill down to a depth of two metres, insert a two metre length steel tube and we're just going to repeat the process. So at a depth of two metres, our resin is going to compact and consolidate the soil, fill the voids, and when all the voids have been filled, the soil has been fully compacted by our material because the resin at that point is then still expanding, it's going to start pushing upwards against that one metre pressure bulb that we've just created and in turn that will start pushing against the underside of the footing and again we'll get that flicker of lift on the laser gauge basically verifying that that foundation is now supported. So we stop that injection, remove that, that two metre length steel tube and we're just going to repeat that process at one metre along the foundation. <coughs> Excuse me. And we just do it at one metre intervals along the length of the strip footing. This can be applied to any kind of foundation, you know, a property built off a raft, if it was a raft foundation it would just be a grid pattern of injection points similar to a slab, um, a pad foundation, you know, a column built off a pad, you know, if it was a 2 by 2 metre pad there would probably be 2, maybe 3 injection points on the pad, uh, but it really can apply to any kind of foundation. Um, so um, in terms of um, you know, more traditional methods, you know, traditional underpinning piling basically, if you think of Eurotech solutions and um, how non-disruptive it is, there really is no comparison. You know, typical residential projects were on site, maybe one, maybe two days. Um, I've described there dealing with an, um, you know, an external wall. You know, in terms of attendances that we would need before we turn up site is almost nothing. Um, you know, if there was like paving slabs up against the wall, you know, we could drill through them or we just take them up prior to us to us turning up. If it was an internal load bearing wall that we were treating, for example, um, if the floor was a concrete slab, obviously we can just drill through the concrete slab, not a problem. If you had a suspended floor, you would need to take up some floorboards for us, um, or maybe just cut some hatches at our injection points. Um, but when you consider that, you know, the intrusion of that in comparison to traditional methods, you can't really compare it, to be honest. Um, so again, in terms of what we need to be aware of on site, certainly uh, it's the same thing, drains and services, really. Um, in a residential scenario, uh, if we're treating an external wall, Sometimes a nice idea to actually dig a little trial hole so we can actually see where an electric or a gas main is coming into the property. Um, in any case, our operatives always CAT scan everything before they do any drilling, but you can't obviously you can't always find everything. Um, so it's a nice it's nice if they can actually see where the service is coming in, just where it's coming in the, the, the direction of the run. Just gives them that extra confidence they're not going to drill through it. Um, and again, drains, you know, it's the same thing. If there are any drains nearby, we can um, under, uh, carry out drain protection to make sure that there's no issues. Um, so that's ground improvement. 
Within that comes um, structural support. Now this is a sample of it. Um, now this is a, basically a cross section through effectively what looks like a pile, uh, just a cross section through it. Uh, and these come in a maximum length of about seven meters. Uh, but what, uh, what this is, this is our material inside here, and this material on the outside here is Kevlar. Now this was a 40 mil sleeve. Uh, now when is, that is um, installed into the soil as a sleeve, we basically attach the injection tube to the top of it and inject our material into the sleeve. So as the, um, our material is injected, it expands and then the sleeve inflates to basically create what looks like a pile. But the idea about these is that um, the top of it is basically sitting underneath the foundation, the bottom of it is sitting in competent soil, so we're helping to transfer the load through it. But also if you have these spaced in the soil at very close centres, as they expand, you basically help compact the soil in between them. So it's just another method of ground improvement. But these were developed basically to deal with... Sorry. I've got a question. Um, what about the ground's width? Does that cause any difficulty? Ground? No, no, not at all. No. Our, uh, our material is impermeable yeah. and it will displace water. Yeah. But obviously if you've got a very high water table, we might need to look at that within the uh, ground investigation just to see that, you know, suitability and then we're not going to cause any problems. But water will not affect our material in any, any way, shape or form, basically. But the fact that the ground's wet, doesn't yeah. that mean that there isn't very much room for expansion? Well, basically our material would take up the pore space that the water is currently sitting in, so it would basically push it away. Yeah, yeah. So I should have mentioned on the previous slide, actually, uh, more applicable to road projects when we're dealing with concrete slabs, but um, a lot of the time you find water sitting underneath these slabs because of like, water ingress in between the joints. Um, now I've mentioned that we sort of pre-drill all the holes and then inject each one individually. If there's a lot of water sitting underneath that slab, when you start injecting our material, it'll basically push the water away and you can have little fountains of water coming up out of the injection holes where, where our resin is actually getting rid of the water. And that's only a good thing, because you're sort of getting rid of it. Because obviously the water is kind of causing the problem for the slab being unstable. Um, but yeah, talking about this uh, structural support, bottom of it underneath the foundation, good of it, good, um, sorry, top of it underneath the foundation, bottom of it, good ground, so we're transferring the load through compacting the soil in between um, but these were developed to deal with very very weak ground conditions because obviously the ground has to be weak enough to enable these to inflate but if you just do this method of injecting just into the soil into very weak soil we're not going to be able to gain a significant improvement on it um, so that's why this product was developed um, so we're talking sort of uh, organic type soils maybe peat or you know very very weak sand for, some, for example but um, it's just another product that was developed now I will just pass that, that, that goes in the 40 mil hole you yeah so we'll just call it 40, 40 mil hole basically right, so. yeah precisely um, I'll just mention when when you feel that sample just take note of how much more dense the resin is within that sample this one the resin has just been injected into a mold so it's basically had the ability to expand to what we call its free rise density so it's density of, you know in air but because that resin has been injected into a sort of a confined space, it hasn't had the ability to expand as much, but it's still got the same expansive ratio, so you actually end up with a much more dense resin. You know, if you inject this material one metre below ground level and then 10 metres below ground level, the material at 10 metres below ground level, because it's in a more confined space under a high load, it won't expand as much, but it'll actually be a lot more, a lot more dense and a lot, a lot stronger, basically. Uh, it's just an interesting sample to, to have, a, have a look at. But again, that's injected and it cures in about 30 to 40 seconds, so it's you know, almost immediate. Um, so can I just ask about yeah. the, the 30 seconds yeah. and the 100 metres from your truck? Is yeah. it, are those two facts? Right, so no, you? because there's two components because to our material. Go, yeah. There's two components and there's not came, the, they, uh, the two components meet at the injection point, which is yeah. the injection gun. So there's no chemical reaction before the injection so gun, basically. No, 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 no. no. That's why we can't treat to a more than about 20 metres, because once it starts to get to the bottom of 20 metre steel tube, it's beginning to want to set, yeah. How so long does it take to set? About 30 to 40 seconds. So if you inadvertently um, put it into a drain, yeah. someone's got to flush that drain out within 30 seconds, I think? No, it can, be, it can be jetted out once it's cured. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. You don't drill it out or anything? No, we'll just jet it, yeah. And you know... If we had to reline the pipe, for example, because we cause you know quite a bit of damage, that is all covered within the drainage protection costs. It's just a fixed rate. Um, so if you know if they bubbles up and you know cause a big problem, you know it's all it's all covered basically. But the whole point of having that drain protection crew on site is to ensure that there's no problems. So um, it's very rare that we cause problems with drains. Could, could I just ask another yeah. question? Yeah. I'm just going to leave it till the yeah. end. But I, I used this system yeah. um, a few years ago. And the explanation for what happened was given the, the two part, um, two components yeah. to, to the resin. 
uh, were applied due to a, a mistake in calibration. Or right, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and the chemical reaction wasn't as it should have been. Okay, yeah. The result of that was a smell that right. was inside this house, which yeah. um, the, the owner of the house complained about yeah. and thought it was hard for fumes and all the rest right, of it. Right, okay, yeah. And that led to a massive inquiry, all sorts of boffins taking air samples and yeah. the rest of it, and half the thing was taken out. Right, okay. At enormous expense. Yeah. I, is that, you, you mentioned that, that it was inert. Yeah. Um, so that shouldn't have happened. Have, have you heard of that before? Uh, well, yeah, obviously they're in these two components, they're specific ratios as to how much of one and how much of the other to, to ensure that the material is correct, basically. So if there was an operational issue, yes. that might have been potential, you know, they, they won't mix correct, correctly, potentially, on, yeah, so, um, yeah, but, um, yeah, obviously I'm normally sort of highlighting that because it's something that doesn't happen often, you know, or, you know, but, um, yeah, um, but, yeah, they, they, they are mixed at a certain I ratio, yeah. Doubts. I mean, this is probably 12 or 15 years ago. Right, I yeah, my yeah. I that this homeowner was a little bit fussy. Right, okay, yeah. And, and so on and so forth. Yeah. The scientists did back up what he was saying. Right, okay. Yeah, I mean, I've been in the, Europe, the company five years. Yeah. It's changed, you know, it's come a long way since I first started, and certainly 15 years ago, um, it yeah, it would have been a lot different to the way it is now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about this. Alan is trying to tell me I'm going to be here on that, that. <laughs> Right, um, so now talking about the last aspect of the works that we do, um, filling voids and water sealing. Um, so when I'm talking about filling voids here, I'm talking about sort of a bulk fill to voids, you know, uh, typical scenarios where you may be using foam concrete, for example. Um, but basically we have two Eurotech resins that are specifically designed for uh, void filling. Um, now these two materials are very lightweight. The first one has only got a density of 30 kilos per cubic metre, very, very lightweight. Uh, but we, we don't offer any kind of compressive strength with it. Uh, the second material has got a dens density of 50 kilos per cubic metre, and that's got a compressive strength of 150 kilopascals. So it's got a strength, you know, it's not strong as concrete, ob obviously, but um, you know, if you have a scenario where that is adequate, you know, you could think of a Eurotech solution. The benefit being is that these materials cure so quickly, and also they are very, very lightweight. But the typical sort of scenarios that we're doing, void filling, would uh, filling up disused drainage systems, you know, uh, you know disused culvert, uh, subway that needs filling in, but any scenario where you're thinking of, uh, you know, maybe uh, grout or foam concrete, you know, Eurotech may be able to offer a solution. Um, we then have uh, water sealing. So, yeah, I've mentioned that the, the material uh, does not affect water, water will not affect our material, but it's impermeable. Uh, so if there is a water leak, um, you know, into a basement or something, for example, um, we could look to inject behind like a concrete wall to create basically like a curtain wall of our material within the soil to try and prevent that water ingress. So it can be used for water sealing. Um, other sort of projects we've looked at is kind of like basement car parks where the basement level is below the water table. Water's getting in through, you know, a secant piled wall, for example. You know, we're looking to drill through, through actually horizontally through the piles of the basement car park to actually inject behind the piles to create a water barrier, basically. Uh, but basically, we inject it, it takes the water space to where the water was, cures almost instantly at 30 seconds, so we do have the ability to be able to stop water leaks. Uh, so it's just another solution to consider. Um, so I'll talk about now, um, yeah, some previous projects that we've completed, and there's a bit sort of range of different jobs here. Um, so we got here, uh, Farnham Rail Depot, completed um, in 2010. Uh, what we had here was uh, about six, five or 6,000 square metres of uh, unstable slabs. Uh, but basically, slabs, and you've got a, train, uh, a track going over the top. Now you can see these slabs are uneven, and as a result, the, uh, the track is basically out of tolerance for train to be able to go over it at the speed that they need to. Um, so basically, they approached Eurotech for a solution, and basically, this is an after photo on the bottom. And basically, we've just helped them to re-level those slabs. Uh, didn't need to be 100% one, you know, 100% perfect re-level, but just to be bring the slabs back in tolerance, just so that the uh, trains could go over that that track at the speed that they needed to. Um, you know, what would the alternatives be? Take it all out and start again. Uh, but then it's the disruption of that, it's the time scales involved with doing that, and then that depot's got to be unoperational whilst the works are done. Um, whereas we can come in and we undertook this work within five weeks. I'll just explain some of these photos on this slide from the project. So um, our vehicles look slightly different now, 
but basically that is the lorry that we turn up in. It's self-contained, it's got a generator on it, uh, so we don't need access to any electricity. There's no water required for our process, so we don't need access to water or electricity. It's self-contained, that's what we turn up in. These are the hoses that carry our material from the, from the vehicle to, to the site, basically. Um, and the maximum length is about yeah, 100, we do have a couple of vehicles with about 150 metres of hose. But basically, as long as we can get that vehicle to within about 150 metres, that's absolutely fine. Um, this is one of our operatives here, uh, basically injecting our material. And as he's injecting it, he's basically monitoring the laser gauge, watching out for that flicker of lift. This is an operative here, basically uh, drilling one of our injection points. So we literally use handheld Hilti drills. They do come on small rigs, um, but you know we can drill by hand as well. So if you've got you know confined space or access constraints on site, we can work around that because basically that is this is basically the plant and equipment we use. It's minimal. Um, right, this was uh, another sort of rail depot, Ilford Cross Rail Depot. Uh, what this project was, was a, a refurbishment, uh, but what as, a, as a result of the refurbishment they're increasing the loading on the existing foundations and what we had here was basically pad foundations and strip footings. Um, this is the wall in question uh, with the uh, foundations that we need to treat. Um, now basically they told us what the loadings were, uh, obviously we looked at the ground investigations and determined about I think a four metre, uh, four to five metre depth of treatment required beneath these foundations. Now, originally, the client on this particular project was looking at a, um, a piling solution. The problem with the piling solution is that no works could be done externally. And the reason for that is because on the other side of this wall is a live railway track. So basically, there was no room there to do the work, and they weren't prepared to close the track. If they were to do the piling option internally, too much of a disruption for the warehouse, they'd have to close it down, can't remain operational, so basically the client's not going to be able to use it. So that's why they approached Eurotech. So this is basically the working area that we took up just, they just provided a bit of access there for our vehicles, just closed off that small area, and all of this area can remain operational. We're not impacting that warehouse at all. This photo here shows, shows one of the pad foundations. We've just got a column built off it there, but basically on this pad foundation, we've got about four injection points going to five metres below ground level. So we're just injecting, getting that flicker of lift, improving the, um, the bearing capacity of the soil to the loading that re they required. Uh, but basically, we completed that work within 12 days, minimal disruption for the client. Um, and yeah, I think the, uh, the piling solution was um, several weeks, their program as well, so it was cost saving for them in terms of the fact that we actually undertook the work a lot more quickly. Right, this is a residential project we completed for Glasgow Housing Association. Uh, this, this was about, about six years ago. Uh, but basically they had um, 38 properties on a particular development, that the, uh, on, uh, which was sort of uh, the council's housing stock, uh, but basically all Every property, all 38 of them, were suffering from subsidence to one degree or another. Uh, basically, what they had was uh, four metres of made ground underneath these houses. Um, so basically, that required 900 linear metres of walling to be uh, underpinned. Um, but it wasn't just external walls, it was internal load-bearing walls as well. Um, so anyway, uh, Eurotech were approached and we completed this project within 16 weeks. So 900 metres of wall or foundation completed within 16 weeks. Um, if you think of doing traditional underpinning, um, certainly with these internal walls as well, you know, there's going to have to be alternative accommodation for the people living in these properties. It's going to be a lot more intrusive, you know, it's going to take a hell of a lot more time. Whereas Eurotech can just come in, people don't necessarily have to move out, it's just a case of, again, taking up floor coverings for us, removing a bit of furniture, you know, maybe removing the floorboard. Um, but again, this is, um, this is a photo of, of us here treating one of the external walls. So this is, the, this is the injection gun, so the material is mixed within that injection gun before it's in, then injected through that steel tube. I mentioned earlier about doing the kind of top-down method, inject at one metre depth, two metre depth, you know, in a sequence like that. Uh, what we're doing here is what we call extraction. Uh, so because we're treated to four metres below ground level here, um, the bottom of that steel tube is at four metres. We start injecting and then this unit here slowly extracts the steel tube whilst we're injecting. So we're almost just creating like a, a pillar or a column of improved soil rather than that top-down method. It's just a different method, it just depends on what the crime of the job is as to which one's used. But that's basically what you're doing there. Well, you, um, sorry. Well, you mentioned uh, raising up that uh, ground <coughs> bearing slab yeah. incrementally. Yeah. Is that top-down or is that from that? Uh, you'd, you'd just be injecting just underneath the slab basically. So if we if we're really once that set once your first one is set once you've got that flicker and then you do that yeah. flow more the second lot must go yeah oh so basically the way to think of it is like we're creating like um well I think of it as like pancakes of resin almost because yeah. you're creating a pancake 
that cures and then you drill to the top of that pancake and then inject again, you're creating like another pancake of resin almost, if that makes sense. So basically creating sort of small layers of resin. So you'd be starting just underneath the slab on top of the resin that we've just, just injected. But how's that the first one it sealed up all the, all the hardcore and stuff? And so yeah, it, it would, yeah, yeah, no, it would do. But basically because there's basically all we're doing then is there's just a void that needs filling. The void isn't actually there, but the void is where the slab needs to be, oh, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. So on that first, if we're doing impasses, on that first injection, we'd have filled all the voids mm -hmm. and then got that flicker of lift, stabilised it. When we do the second pass, we're then just injecting our resin on top of the resin that we've already just injected and doing it like that. Right. So that top-down method only applies to ground improvement, mm -hmm. where we're doing, doing this, basically, underpinning. Do you do a whole house at a time? In other words, before you go on to the adjoining house. Yeah, we tend to do that. Only, yeah. Normally when you're underpinning, you do yeah. one side, a section of one bit of the wall, yeah. and you do diagonally across the No, other. No, we wouldn't do it like that at all. You just work in a sequence. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't Not affect at all. stability. No, no. I mean, you treat, you treat a one, one wall in one go, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there would be no requirement to go like that, you know, diagonally. No. I mean, you just go all, all the way down the Yeah, same. yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> So, would you use that at the same time then, though? And not, I mean, like, sorry, leaving on from yeah. that, I mean, if you were doing, uh, say, one half metres, I, I don't know what the spread of that would be when it's in the ground, but would you have uh, five or six holes and then inject it at the same time? No, you'd work in a sequence, basically. What we oh. tend to do is install each of the injection yeah. points, yeah. install all, all of the steel tubes, and then inject them all individually. Right. So, you just start just start along where we're starting the treatment and then just work along injecting each one of those one metre intervals. Okay. What about the party wall between each one? Right, yeah. So if we're, so if we're treating a party wall then we certainly need... Do the party wall under both the adjoining properties? Well? Yeah, we can do party walls, yeah. Um, obviously if we're um, treating a property and we're treating the party wall of that property but we're not treating any walls of the adjoining property, we would need to let that person know that we're treating that wall and more than likely than not, we're going to need access into that property to basically monitor from their side. Um, certainly, certainly if there's um, you know, suspended floors in the properties, because obviously there's a void underneath the floor, and we don't want to be filling up the void with our material, so you know, we want to be in there to monitor. that. upset the adjoining property by doing just one of them? No, 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 not at all. Would you serve party wall notice in that case? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Um, this is drainage protection here, uh, so this is basically just a drain operative, that's, you know, that's a reel with the camera at the end of it, so that's basically in the uh, manhole in the drainage pipe monitoring it, to, again, to make sure there's no problems. Um, on that gun, you say the, the two things get mixed up in the gun, yeah. hand gun. Yeah. so the stuff in the tube from there onwards yeah. is going to set in 30 seconds. Everything this side of the gun yeah. is not going to set, it's yeah. only that stuff there. Uh, so but there's compressed, there's compressed air to get our material through the hose, yeah. through the gun, and through there. Okay. Well, now, when, when you've finished injecting, can you clear that tube, or do you? No, no. We just take it out and dispose of it, and insert another steel tube. Right. So that the tubes aren't reused. Once they've been used, they've been used basically. Yeah. So, but once we've injected, obviously he's doing the extraction method here. But if we do that top-down method, the steel tubes aren't extracted, but we take them out basically. Um, but they're, they're not re reused, we just use more uh, new steel tubes basically. So can I ask one other question? Yeah. Do you know you said that there are the two materials that merge yeah. to sort of... Yeah. Are, are, are they mixed in together to be injected at the same time? There's no, not two that goes down to one place to mix together, is there? So, this, so basically, at the back of the gun is three, three tubes going into yeah. it, two components. Oh and compressed air. And right. the compressed air is just to get the material through, through the hose, basically. So within the gun, the, the two components are, in, uh, are mixed, basically. They mix, basically, right at the end of the gun, and then they're, they're basically shot down through the tube by the compressed air. Um, so one thing to mention is, that, uh, you know, about pressures and things. People say, you know, you must be injecting that, a great big pressure. No, it's not like grout at all. There's no overburden pressure, I don't think of that, because it's not grout. Um, the only pressure is caused by the expansion of the resin, which does have a big uh, expansive force. Right, uh, Baines, that stands for Bath and North East Somerset Council. Um, so these, these are just some examples of some road projects that we've completed for them. 
Uh, these two roads here are right in the city centre of Bath. Um, and this is a, a road coming out of Bath. Um, but basically what we've got here are concrete roads. You've got a very thin asphalt overlay on the top, but basically these slabs are moving, they're unstable. And as a result, you've got reflective cracking through the asphalt at the joints, just general poor quality road surface. Um, council will need to resurface these roads, but if they don't address the concrete, the resurface won't last, basically. Um, so how are they going to address the concrete? They're either going to basically Eurotech it, or they're going to have to take the concrete out and re uh, you know, reconstruct it. The problem with doing that is that these roads are right in the city centre of Bath. It's, it's, it's you know, a very, very busy place. Um, so you know, it's a disruption because of road closures and that kind of thing. Even if they did a reconstruction job on this and opened those roads back up during the day, you know, there's going to be ramps, exposed ironworks. It's going to slow the traffic right down. Uh, so anyway, they approached Eurotech to uh, you know, see if we could come up with a solution. So anyway, obviously we could do a visual, visual survey to actually see you know, movement, you know, where the buses are going over the slabs, you actually see them rocking. And, but what we also did was a GPR survey, and that was to basically identify where there was potential voiding, where you know, there were soft spots of ground underneath the slabs. Anyway, so that enabled us to scope the work, and basically the council gave us a, uh, a nighttime road closure. Um, so basically this, we came in on a road closure, just drill again in that injection <coughs> pattern of 1.5 metre centres, uh, inject just underneath the slab to stabilise them. We don't need to re-level them, there's no point because the council is going to come in and plane off and resurface it after anyway, so we just stabilise it to ensure those slabs are stable and not moving. Um, this particular road, um, Manvers Street, uh, this was actually done under two-way traffic lights because they needed to keep that road open because it's quite near the train station, but again, you know, we can just do one half of the road swap the TM over on the next night and work on the other side of the road. It really makes no difference whatsoever. So, you know, we can work under minimal TM. This particular road, uh, going out to a place called Kelston, it's an A road, uh, but basically you can see these large cracks opening up in the road. And as a result of that, they basically had to close the road, an emergency road closure. Now, the effective length of the road was only about 400 metres long, but the official diversion was several miles. Uh, but basically what's happening here is that there's a retaining wall here with a slope on the other side of it. That's basically pulling away from the road allowing these, uh, these voids and cracks to open up. Um, I mentioned that the official diversion route was uh, several miles long, so it was you know, quite inv inconvenient to uh, road users. So the local farmer had a good idea. The person who ran this field here actually built a toll road through his field and charged people £1.50 mm -hmm. to unofficially <laughs> use this little uh, toll road. Um, it was actually in the news, he didn't have planning yeah. permission or anything like that. But um, I think he you know, broke even, I think, you know, the construction costs and that much money. But um, anyway, what the council got us in to do was basically just to inject to fill the voids that had opened up. They actually had to pile this wall to stop it moving anymore because you know, it was quite significant movement but they got us in just to basically stitch these, these cracks up. So what we're doing is we're injecting to about a, a metre beneath the road surface, just injecting, filling the voids, and when the, all the voids have been filled, we get that flicker of lift, and that's basically just verification that all the voids have been filled. So we're just injection, injecting kind of offset in 1.5 metre centres. Uh, but again, you know, that's our vehicle where the material is held, it's just a hose running from the vehicle, attach that to the steel tube and inject. Right, this is an, uh, quite an interesting project. What we've got here is a brand new housing development. Um, all of the roads on this development are due to be adopted by Kent County Council. Now, it's only been brought up to bind a uh, course, but underneath that road, you've got uh, about five metres of made ground. It hasn't been comp it's not compacted very well. So as a result, the road is beginning to shine, uh, show signs of settlement. The council will be uh, responsible for the maintenance of that road once they adopt it, but obviously there's five metres of made ground that they're gonna have to be responsible for as well, and it's gonna likely to continue to move. Um, so the, the, basically the developer here needs to address that because otherwise the road is not going to be adopted. Uh, so we're uh, approached to basically provide a ground improvement solution. So although we use ground improvement on subsidence, you know, we can use it in a scenario like this as well. The bottom of these steel tubes are actually five metres beneath the road. So we're injecting our material through them and then, again using that extraction method to fill all the voids and compact the made ground to improve it. Um, obviously we worked on sort of not an official road closure, but basically the developer closed off areas of road for us and it was minimal disruption. Again, you know, there's no excavation with, uh, involved with our process. What would the alternatives here be? Dig it all up and start again? It's just not going to happen. Um, but yeah, we were on site there for about five weeks after taking this work. Um, you, know, you know, the alternative methods were a lot more disruptive and would have taken a lot longer. Anyway, the road was eventually adopted by the council. This is a project we completed in uh, Croydon. Uh, basically, typical sort of scenario for us, house suffering from subsidence, you know, problem signs like this. Um, but basically, um, we had the ground investigation done and that basically showed uh, poor loose ground to a depth of two metres. And I think it was actually a problem with the uh, drains, basically. 
drainage leak, washing away fines, loose soil, voids <coughs> underneath the foundations. Uh, so yeah, we determined a uh, treatment depth, depth of two metres, and then so we inject from two metres to the underside of the foundation to improve that soil, to allow the soil to take the load of those foundations, to basically stop it moving and basically deal with the substance. But again, that's, that's a laser gauge, so that's a laser gauge we mount onto the wall to monitor for lift. So as soon as we get that flicker of lift, it's basically verified that the uh, foundation is supported. But that's a sort of typical day-to-day -day project that we get, get involved with. Um, in two days, that's completed it. Yeah. Building expert. No, 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 not at all. No. Sorry, what was the question? Do you mean building rates? No. No. Uh, no. 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 So you could give that warranty. Yeah. Yeah. Ten-year warranty on design, workmanship, and material. What would be the average cost for a project like that? Uh, yeah, they're probably ranging sort of average price sort of three to six thousand pounds, possibly eighty, something like that. Um, just depends on the depth of the treatment and you know how many linear meters of wall that we're treating. Get asked all the time, you know, how much per meter of wall is it? There is no cost because um, every project is different because um, it depends on the depth of the treatment. <coughs> it depends on how voided the soil or loose the soil is because it's more loose and voided. It'll take more material to you know to, to solve the problem, but. That's probably the typical sort of average price is something like that. Excuse me, I was going to ask the question on cost. If you, um, this come back to your ground uh, slab stabilisation, because yeah. um, you said you don't need a great deal of investigation, yeah. so how would you determine how much of this material is going in? Yeah. And how would me, as a survivor, advise on what the cost of that was as a remedial treatment uh, against you know, more conventional methods? Yeah, um, so again, it's difficult to give a price per square metre, but Probably typically uh, for sort of a residential scenario, maybe sort of 60, 75 pounds a square meter, something like that. But yeah, I mean, if we're doing, dealing with a residential scenario, obviously what we don't want to do is force people to dig trial holes through their slab inside their house. Um, you could maybe do a core, uh, which is going to tell us maybe how deep the void is underneath. But a lot of the time, there's telltale signs when you go and look at the property. You know, if you go up to the front door, you've got to walk up a couple of steps to the front door, then you know you've got maybe a metre, you know, a couple of metres of fill material that the slab was put on. And if that slab's dropped, it could just be consolidation of the fill material. So then you think, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to re-level the slab, but then we're also going to treat that fill material as well to the metre, two metres beneath the slab. So um, how would you price the job then? How, how, how would you go about that in terms? Because I, I noticed yeah. a lot of your examples are, are, are more commercial uh, based. So yeah. my usual system yeah. My yeah. was actually uh, against the railway bank. Okay, um, yeah. And it was Network Rail who recommended it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in terms of how the, each project is costed, it's basically mobilisation, yeah. so a fee to get us to sign number of days to do the book, do the work, and then material. Um, now we will look at the projects and estimate how much material it's going to take, and we can give a fixed costing on that. You know, we don't have to give you, oh, material is this for X amount of material, any additional we, we've charged at this rate, we can give a fixed costing. That's oh, what so we you do. would do that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. What about coverage nationwide? Cover the whole of the UK, yeah. So. Um, our head office is in uh, St Helens, we've got a small office down in Banbury, <coughs> which is where I'm based, and then we've got um, three depots uh, in Skelmersdale, near Liverpool, we've got one in Winchester, and then one in Sandy in Bedfordshire, but cover the whole of the UK, we do work in Ireland, you know, basically we just put our trucks onto ferries to get over there. So. Dave, can I give you a piece of information that might yeah. be interesting, yeah. like the, the project that I was referring to, uh, you're trying just £12,000 for, for doing this yeah. slab. Yeah. Because of the chemical problem, it had to be taken out. Yeah. It was the, the alternative method in the first place. That cost eighty thousand pounds. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah. You know, yeah. That illustrates. You know, yeah. Know, yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. Economic Certainly. In, yeah. Comparing it to a traditional, most yeah. definitely. Um, this is just another example here. Uh, but basically, what we've got is we've got a bridge. Uh, now mm -hmm. this. Uh, Basically, this is a wing wall, and the other side there is an abutment. But basically, all this, this material, which goes to about nine metres depth beneath the road, has been undermined. There's voids, and as a result, those voids have compromised the stability of the, uh, the fill material up to beneath the road surface. So you've got this settlement occurring. Um, so what we've come in is we basically uh, drilled again in a grid pattern at 1.5 metre centres. The bottom of these, we're doing that top method down here on this particular one. So at each injection point, we've got about um, eight steel tubes. One going to one metre, two metres, three metres. So we inject each one individually until we get that flicker of lift at each injection point. And what we're doing is we're filling the voids that are present within the soil and then compacting the soil to improve it. Um, typical solution here would be excavate all that material, bring in new adequate material. 
there's a time scale involved in doing that. This is an A road. Obviously, we're doing it under a full road closure, uh, but we're probably comp completing that within about a tenth of the time you know, for a more traditional method. But um, it's just quite a good photo because basically this is what the operation looks like. I think we're coming to the end. So, yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, to sort of summarise, um, these are basically the sectors that we're working in. In terms of residential, uh, we do a lot of private residential work and we do a lot of insurance work as well for uh, loss adjusters, you know, Crawford's, Cumming and Lindsay. Um, and then works for local authorities on their housing stock, you know, and housing associations. And then infrastructure, you know, we do a lot of sort of works on roads, uh, Highways England and sort of main contractors like Amy, for example, and Kia. Uh, rail works, network rail. Um, and then sort of in commercial settings, you know, dealing with warehouses and that kind of thing. So hopefully sort of gain an understanding of what Eurotech does. Hopefully that was uh, interesting. Um, but in terms of um, main things to take away, from the presentation would just be the speed of the operation and the non-disruptiveness of it. Uh, that's really where the benefits come into play. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, I'll take any questions if there if there are any. Thank you. The um, the pile type solution. What yeah. sort of length or depth? It's about seven seven meters is the maximum depth we can treat it with that. And what do you do? Do you pre drill a hole? So basically, we call we depth? call basically a forty mil size hole to the depth. Then the power pile, or yeah, it's called a power pile basically, is then inserted and then we inject the material into the power pile and, and then it inflates in, in situ. Through a tube from the bottom and upwards. Precisely, yeah. Yeah. One of the illustrations was a concrete slab on a long way. Yeah. Um, when you say you can lift a saddle, what's, what's the maximum you can lift a saddle, for example? There isn't really a maximum, to be honest. Um, you know, we've done slab work on the M25 where we've lifted it, you know, at least 100 mil. Right. Um, so, That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, most projects are nothing like that, but yeah, we can lift quite a significant amount. Um, In respect to the historic structures and reversibility, is there any way to actually protect, you know, old stone foundations or something from getting stuck up with all this polyurethane? Oh, right, okay. Well, well yeah, in terms of historic, yeah. Um, Obviously, we've worked on properties in the past where there's minimal foundation. That really doesn't affect our process at all. Yeah. But what you talk about, our material getting up in... I haven't really yeah. thought it through. I'm yeah. just thinking historic structures, one of the things that seems, yeah. if it's like the crazy phone that people fill around windows, right. sort yeah. of, it's incredibly sticky. Yeah, yeah. So if you've got some historic structures, the last thing you want is some 21st century material clinging to historic stone. Oh, that's what you're saying, yeah. I mean, obviously, we're injecting it beneath ground yeah, level, yeah, yeah. beneath the yeah. foundations. Um, yeah. Yeah, all the way don't, yeah, our material is not like the expanding foam that you put in your cavity wall, no. you stop injecting, and you know, that's it's not enough. Inject a bit more, all sudden it's all uh, coming out, it's not like that. But. Yes, yeah, I suppose that is it. Is the material affected by any chemicals at all? Yeah, there are uh, some very, there are, we, do, we have a specific list of everything that does affect our material. Uh, there's not a lot, a great deal of things, but it tends to be things like, I oh, don't know, sulfuric acid or something like that um, but we've got a list of what does affect it but at the end of the day we'll look at the ground investigation and if but there's anything there. Or diesel wouldn't affect it? Uh, no, no, because um, obviously we're undertaking work on roads but um, yeah basically we'd look at the ground investigation to determine if there's anything there that might affect it to determine suitability or we'll certainly make the client aware of, of it. And a range of pH of the groundwater? Yeah, no, no it doesn't problem. affect us at all, yeah. So we could come directly to you to design, install, and have it warranted and certified? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. One thing I haven't mentioned is we've got an in-house engineering department. They can do that cost, but they can do it feasibility studies and that kind of thing. But certainly we'll do, uh, you know, we, we can do the design, basically. Would you be happy to work up from other people's site investigations and geotechnicals? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. We don't actually do them in-house ourselves. If we need to provide them oh, as part, we yeah. subcontract sub yeah. track that out to our suppliers. But yeah, yeah. on yeah. probably most projects, we're actually provided with all that information, yeah. and then we work from that. So. Is there a the possibility of an extended warranty beyond 10 years? Yeah, I don't No, No, <laughs> unfortunately not. No, 10 years. Um, Just 10 years is the warranty, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it might be the properties like 100 years going to be around. And it's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think when you, it's just when you're sort of thinking of maybe poll, you know, other sort of solutions, I think the general standard is 10 years. But. 
The reality is, if it was to move again after 10 years, it's probably a new issue wow. causing the movement rather than uh, a neurotech, I would say. So. Okay, that's great. Thanks,